Uh, welcome, everyone. Okay. So we have one board member that is uh, remote tonight, just so everybody knows. So we are all here. Um, is there any public comment? Lisa, that's you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So we're just going to jump into uh, district reports and uh, keep this moving. So superintendent's report. Test, test, all right. So I just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, several of these are on, the, uh, on my report, but there's one other, or actually two other things I want to address. Um, Lori and I followed up with MTSBA, and uh, the board has once again earned the golden gavel for next year, so everybody was certified as a trustee again this year. Uh, so I believe that's 32 years. Um, it's also my great pride, um, the surprise on this got ruined, so I was going to make it a surprise tonight, but uh, on behalf of the School Administrators of Montana, I want to uh, uh, give this award uh, from the Montana School Administrators of Montana, Montana's Youth Endowment Program, and that's a program from the different uh, administrative organizations that goes to uh, youth in need around the state. And uh, that program has donated $1,000 to Thomas DiGiolinardo. All right, now for the good news. Um, share the, the latest weekly report from the, the Yellowstone County Unified Health Command. And for the first time since... Uh, we started hearing the rumors about coronavirus. This is the first time that they've been doing these reports and every single item for Yellowstone County is in the green. So um, we haven't seen the rebound that I think people were worried about and uh, hopefully we can uh, avoid what's going on with some of these other states where they're bouncing back. Um, Lockwood COVID case, we've had one positive case reported in approximately six weeks, I believe. Um, we had a handful there right around the start of March, and so uh, that's going well. And so because of those things, because of the changes to the CDC guidelines, most importantly, the three-foot distancing amongst children um, and some of the cleaning recommendations later in the action agenda, there will be some uh, recommendations to change some of the guidelines and the policy that we have, uh, we've adopted. Um, we're hard at work. We do have 90 students that are still doing distance learning at last count, so that's still a significant amount of kids that we are providing services to while they're at home and learning from home. Uh, the biggest number of those are in the middle school. And then uh, we are working on a total of eight weeks of summer school. We're going to have a three-week session in, in uh, June, a three-week session in July, and then a two-week session in August. Uh, those numbers are starting to fill up. Parents are finally getting back to us on those. But uh, the more kids that we can get involved with summer school, the, the way we can backfill some of those, those uh, learning gaps that we might have established between last March and, and now. So if you get that letter from your principal, please, please get that signed up for that. Uh, we had a great presenter last week on the QPR training, which is part of our Hope Squad training. Uh, Frederick Lee is his the gentleman's name, and he did a good job. Uh, we actually had about 25 parents here for a training in the evening as well. And uh, I think we're going to continue to build on that relationship with him as we go forward. Um, speaking of community education, we have uh, the another Tough Topics uh, session coming up. April 26th at 6 p.m. This one's on human trafficking. Um, if you've been following some of the local politics, obviously that's a, that's a hot topic right now. And uh, tomorrow, meeting with the counselors and the principals to kind of expand what we're doing with uh, parentguidance.org and looking for some of those uh, uh, mental health supports for families and students. Uh, at the end of the month, uh, the new uh, MSUB chancellor is going to come out and tour our facilities and meet with myself and, and Mr. Klasna, looking for ways to expand that relationship between MSUB and Lockwood schools. Um, resources, uh, 
Quest has finished a comprehensive facilities audit. Uh, Mr. Daring isn't here tonight, um, but I'm going to have him go over that a little bit in a future board meeting to kind of share that with you. Um, what that's going to allow us to do is be a little bit more proactive with our planning for replacement items, uh, air handlers, those type of things that wear out. Typically schools, uh, you just kind of hope things don't happen all at once and you, you, you fix things as they, as they break. And so our goal is to be able to be proactive with that and start budgeting for those things a couple years out. A um, couple advocacy things. Uh, congratulations to Mr. Chrisman. He was appointed to the Council for Exceptional Children's National Publications Committee, and he was actually asked to be the co-chair of that the initial group. So uh, congrats to him. So um, next one is uh, I was selected. We talked about this a little bit uh, last month. I was selected to the AASA Executive Committee. Uh, that's a huge honor for me. Um, I'm one of 17 uh, representatives in the nation that works directly with our, with our uh, president, uh, president-elect and past president and the executive director on that. So going from the governing board was about 135 members, kind of more like the House of Representatives to the, the executive committee, which is a little bit more like the Senate. So that's a huge honor for that. Um, the reason I bring that up is, um, there are some of times those, those uh, it's a three-year commitment, and there are some times that those meetings conflict with our typical board uh, dates. So I'd propose to the board to maybe, in our policy, put in an alternate date for board meetings, maybe the Thursday before, just so when there's a conflict on those that I can be at those board meetings. So just wanted to plant that seed, and we can discuss that a little bit more as we move forward, um, if Thursdays is a good night or if we want to move them up a full week or, or those type of things. Um, legislature, obviously we're watching that closely. There's, things are just changing, you know, by the afternoon. I was on a conference call with Kirk Miller today and he was listening to one, uh, one of the live streams and, and our federal programs director, uh, Rick Duncan, who helps with some of the advocacy stuff, was listening to another. Obviously, if there's any bills anybody wants to ask questions about, just reach out to me and I can kind of give you what I know about the bill. Um, I am hearing that they're going to try to end the session before the end of April. Um, they want to hold back 10 days or so in case some more things come out of like the American Recovery Act and those type of things that they need to go back and, and meet on without having it to be a special session costing the taxpayers. So um, at the federal level, um, obviously we know with the Senate being as split as it is, there'll be some negotiations on this, but President Biden's initial budget, planned budget or proposed budget for title one and idea both show huge increases um, idea has been an issue it's it's never been fully funded and so getting some movement on that is is huge for the national organizations uh, both of those increases would would absolutely benefit our school district um, shared a message from uh, brian micheletti from the mhsa just thanking mike erickson and and our and uh, gordon klasna and everybody here at lockwood schools for for working with them on the hosting of the, the state tournaments and the divisional tournament for class um, A. Just uh, been real positive about our facilities and the use of them. Uh, we have not been able to host a softball <laughs> game yet at our new facility. The weather has just not been cooperating whatsoever. I, I don't believe our girls have even played a softball game yet. Is that correct, Gordon? Um, every time we've had one, it's, they've been snowed out, rained out, winded out, and uh, it's not looking real good for Thursday either at this point, I don't believe. It's supposed to snow Thursday, I believe. So, um, Mr. Uh, Erickson has worked with our coaches to get a youth sports program up and going. It's really fun to go in and watch those young kids uh, working with our high school students. Uh, I think that was one of the things we really wanted to see with this new facility and having those kids stay here for high school. And then um, later on, we're going to talk a little bit about our spectators uh, uh, stuff or policy. And uh, right now, um, it looks like we are going to be hosting the state lacrosse tournament. That's not an MHSA-sponsored um, program, but that's a group that's going to be renting our facility. And we've had feelers, and I think it's probably a done deal right now that we will be hosting the Montana-Wyoming All-Star basketball game um, and the Montana Class B All-Star football game. So any questions from any trustees on my report? Thank you. All right, thank you. We're gonna move on to uh, primary. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks. <laughs> Um, not much to add to my report. As of today, I have 45 kids confirmed for summer school. So that's exciting. Um, we're getting lots of registrations in for kindergarten two next year. We're going to offer a little incentive to see if we can get all their paperwork and everything in, mostly by the end of the school year. That just helps us plan. So hopefully those parents are getting those immunizations done and getting those kids in here. That's about it. We're plugging away. Any questions? Are there any questions from the board for Ms. Fox? All right, thank you, Mr. Kinsey. Hello. My positive is uh, this is the earliest I think I've had everybody hired in my building, ever. That's, that's a good feeling. Uh, any questions about my report? Any questions for Mr. Kinsey? All right, thank you. Mr. D. Uh, my po new positive is, uh, is that today we have about 10 girls that are competing at the state FCCLA level uh, this Thursday, the competition for that. So that's awesome. Um, other than that, nothing to add, unless you guys have anything. Perfect, awesome, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Klasner. I do not have everyone hired yet, but we're getting close. <laughs> um, you know, this, this last weekend, I think, uh, Mr. Navajo, I let you guys know I was at the state FFA convention for a little bit. It was just real fun to see a different side. That's not where I'm from. It's kind of like um, in a foreign land for me. Um, the only corduroy I knew was the pants I wore, not the blue corduroy FFA. Thanks for people that understand that joke. I appreciate that. Um, so it, but it was real good to be there and, and see that and, and be part of that and see the excitement. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet the, like the head advisor for the country, for the USA. That was real fun to have a chance to talk to him. He's actually a, a principal from Georgia. And so just to see the excitement that people had in there. And that was a sub, I guess I'd call it a subdued, where they are only allowed to have 400 kids at that particular convention this year. Usually there's 1,500. Um, at that state convention, so I'm real excited to uh, just get that program up and running and, uh, and just to have that in our, in our school and just another activity for our students to be uh, involved in. Uh, with that, I don't know if you guys have any questions on my board report. Any questions for Mr. Klasner? Correct, yeah, we, we did that just because we had two uh, that came at the same, same time. I know we had initially looked at having uh, a, one or the other this year and then the other the next year, um, but we didn't have any applicants for another foreign language, so we decided to put both Woods and uh, an egg teacher going this year with us. That'll help uh, build things here. And then actually the end of this month, the 30th, um, OPI, or they're going to send their egg person as well as their CTE person to come down and do a tour of the facilities, and then I believe Taylor Brown is going to do uh, a interview with them uh, for the radio as well. So we'll have some OPI people here as well for both those programs. Part of why we staggered those two programs is we were worried that we weren't going to find enough good candidates, and so to have the, the candidates that we have, we were really pleased with yep. that. Exactly, yeah, because our egg program won't be just high school only. It'll also be in the middle school because uh, eighth graders can be part of FFA. Great, thank you. My one thing with that is he's got 25% of the student body is in athletics this spring. And all I can think about is if they were across the river, I don't think those numbers would be that high. And uh, Darlene. Way up here. <laughs> I shouldn't follow him, right? Um, so I guess what I have to add to mine is we started our uh, SBAC testing yesterday in grades three through five. Everything was going well. And then this morning, we had no internet for a while. So that was a little scary. But before the kids actually started testing, our internet came back. So. Do you have any questions of my report? All right, no questions. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right.
right, uh, teacher negotiation update. Are you going to do that, Tobin? Sure. I think uh, things were going along pretty well, and then at the last meeting, we kind of had a little bit of a, a snag, um, and uh, just honestly, just time hasn't been able to, we haven't been able to meet since then, just getting ready for the board meeting and doing principal interviews and those type of things. I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to continue to work through it and work through some issues. Um, you know, there's some changes, obviously, once you get to talking about salaries and benefits, that becomes personal for people and they're, they're looking at, at where they're at. And, you know, so that's one of the challenges a little bit with the collaborative process is, uh, you know, people can join at any point. And so we haven't, we hadn't done a lot of the, the legwork and some people didn't understand how we'd gotten to where we'd got to. So we have some subcommittees set up. Um, I put together, Lori and I worked together today to put a, get a bunch of information together to get to the the union leadership and and uh, I plan on going over and meeting with Teresa first thing in the morning and sharing with her some of those spreadsheets and some of those scenarios so um, like I said it's it's uh, I was hoping we'd have a contract to approve at this meeting um, that's not going to happen um, but I'm still confident that we're going to be able to work things out and everybody will feel feel comfortable with where we end up all right thank you So we're going to move on to the consent agenda. And if there are no objections to the consent agenda, what will be approved? Actually, Tim, we, we will have to pull uh, Shay Keen off of the consent agenda. She's being hired as the girls' soccer coach. Uh, because she's a relative of Buddy's, he will have to abstain from that. So if we can approve the full uh, consent agenda without Shay and have everybody vote and then have the board minus Buddy vote for Shay's appointment. Sorry, I missed that. I, I was looking ahead going, okay, that's all separate. But So, um, Lisa, did you understand that? Okay. That's what everybody else on the board understands where we're at with those. Okay, so there are no objections to the consent agenda. I have one. Okay. Um, the special meeting that we had for the expulsion, those minutes don't reflect who seconded the motion for the expulsion and I wonder if anybody on the board remembers who did second that motion. Okay. I hadn't made a note of it either, so I, I didn't know how to fill in that blank. I'm sorry, I should have called you, Tim. Well, I think we can, uh, let's pull those minutes out and we'll table those till next month probably. I have that information on my kitchen table. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. I want to make sure I put it in there. That's what I thought it was the ninth, but I want to. I wanted to make sure. Yeah, it's the ninth. All right, so we're going to try this again. So we're going to, out of the consent agenda, we're going to pull the special meeting from the 9th out. And uh, Shay off of the coaches list. I'm going to lose track of all this. All right, so if there are no other objections, that will be approved. And hearing none, that is approved. So I think that's a little confusing. We're going to have to hire Shea as a soccer coach. So if I can get a motion for that. So it's a motion from Joe and a second from Kat to hire it's the girls' soccer coach. So. Do you have that over there, Lisa, then? Got that all straight? Okay. Uh, is there any discussion from the, uh, or questions from the audience? Okay, any discussion or questions from the board? All right, all in favor say aye, except for aye. And any opposed? And that motion carries. So that one is not, nobody, buddy is not voting on that one. Right?
All right, now we're gonna move on to hiring certified staff. So before we hire our new certified staff, I would like to introduce um, my recommendation to be our new middle school principal. Um, is Mark Goyette. Uh, Mark is someone that I've admired from afar for a while in, in his work. Uh, he's coming to us from Glendive Middle School and uh, comes very, very highly recommended and I don't believe that we could have found a better person to add to our administrative team. Mark, would you like to take the mic and maybe introduce yourself and say a few words? And next to him is his wife, Jamie, who will be getting hired at the intermediate building as well, too. I'll have to adjust this up a little higher. Thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have the opportunity to be here before you tonight uh, with the opportunity to potentially join Lockwood uh, Public Schools. Uh, I, this is my 20th year. I'm just completing an education. I, I've spent the first 14 in Laurel Public Schools as a middle school teacher, uh, school counselor, and then a high school counselor for uh, about eight years at the end of that. Transitioned to Glendive as a, an administrator. Spent one year uh, as a high school assistant principal in the past five as the middle school principal there. So excited about the opportunity to uh, come back to this area. We, my wife's family is in Billings here, and uh, we're very excited about the possibility of, of our son attending Lockwood Public Schools, and, and we look forward to potentially being a part of this community. Any, any questions from the board? Well, thank you for making the trip, and uh, we look forward to uh, working with you. And with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the principals, if they have anybody that's on their hire list tonight, to come up and introduce them. Uh, so, Mr. Klasner, would you like to introduce any of the high school teachers we have? I actually have to pull this down a little bit. Wow. Okay. Um, I believe the only person I see um, is Dan Carter, who we're hired. Just kidding. Um, so, uh, Tressa Beaupre, she's uh, sitting over here. Uh, this next year, she is going to uh, start off our chemistry department. She'll also pick up uh, probably uh, in her science class as well, just because that's a big class coming in to kind of help fill out her schedule. So getting that started as we start building up those upper level uh, classes with chemistry and, and physics the following year. Uh, she is currently uh, student, uh, student teaching or just got done student teaching at, at Skyview High School. She's a Billings Senior High School graduate. I believe she actually graduated with Scott's daughter as well, who's uh, on staff here from Billing Senior. So she's a Rocky grad, and we're, we're excited to have uh, Tressa uh, joining our staff here at, at the high school. I have two people here tonight. I have Jamie Goyette, and that's, that's the real star of the Goyette family to, to get us. That's, that's how we got him to... To Lockwood, and then I have uh, I have Jesse Boltwright. Jesse's been with us for sophomore practicum, student teaching. Um, he had a, a long-term subbing contract this year, and then he'll teach fourth grade next year. And Jamie will do fourth grade AP next year. No sped people. Okay. So with that, uh, those introductions, I will give you the list of new hires. Uh, Tressa, I'm going to butcher your last name. I apologize. Uh, matter of fact, I won't even try it. Uh, Adam Fields, Jamie Goyette, Lindsey Harper, Marsha Huffman, Paul Kratt, Nicole Larau, Anna Potter, Michael Staten, and Bryce Wright, as well as Mark Goyette as the middle school principal. All right, I'll entertain a motion. A motion that we uh, hire the certified staff, new hires for 2021-22 year as recommended. You gotta be loud enough for the camera that's way up there. <laughs> All right, so we have a motion from Sylvia and a second from Kat to uh, hire the certified staff um, as presented. Is there any discussion or questions from the uh, audience? 
He will. Um, any questions or discussion from the board? All right. Are you ready, buddy? Okay. Yes, I am. There we go. All in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. All right. Now we have to get into, this is going to be a little more complex again because we have to pull some people out of the higher yeah. list. Before we start that, since we are doing introductions, uh, Mr. Klasner, would you like to talk about Mr. Hill and the work that he's done? And um, he's on the list of rehires, but he's going to be transitioning from teaching English to being the director of alternative ed. Uh, thank you. So uh, last year we hired uh, Cole Hill uh, as our uh, sophomore English teacher, and then um, he and I had a lot of conversations this year, and just um, and through the interview process, uh, he just came out as a, our, our top candidate for our director of alternative education. It'd be nice not to have to worry about um, having to uh, reach kids in a different manner. We could, you know, but not every kid's the same, and we uh, have made a push and a, made a priority for our district to reach those kids that struggle um, and maybe need a little different alternative path uh, for graduation. And so uh, Mr. Hill and I have had a lot of conversations throughout the year about that, what that would look like. Um, he actually started a, um, a class this year, a second semester to help kids uh, recover some credit from first semester as well, kind of thinking outside the box doing that, uh, which has been picked up by another English teacher. And so we, um, he, he's, uh, I think, uh, got a good start on, on working with that. I mean, those, and it, you know, not, not all of our kids. Now, and, that, and I guess one thing I would say, too, is that these aren't just kids that are going to struggle uh, in the school, but also some kids that maybe are advanced and we need to find some internships for them to get them ready for some uh, things down the road and stuff like that too as well. So alternative education isn't just kids that struggle, it's for any kid that maybe the regular education setting isn't, isn't fitting for. And so we'll do stuff with that through him as our, our director of that program. Uh, looking forward to having him uh, in that position and, and, and joining us uh, in the administration team that way. So welcome Cole, thank you. So. Thank you think, Cole. I guess I should rephrase that, Dr. Hill. Cole is just fine, sir. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, I'll make it quick, but first and foremost, you know, it's been a great year so far, even amidst the pandemic. And I've, if you know me, you know I've worked in several districts uh, around for many years now and um, never felt at home like I do here, never felt welcomed and appreciated like I do here, and never felt like I'm a part of a team like I do here. And, uh, that means a lot. I'm very happy to be here. I know that the uh, job that we're about to start doing is extremely important for uh, our district, our community, and our kids that are really at risk. And it's a challenge I embrace. And I think uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of the team and uh, looking forward to that. So thank you for believing me. Thank you for the opportunity. And if you guys have any questions for me? I guess not. Thank you very much for taking on this job. So Thank you so much. Okay, so I think we're going to break this into four pieces because we have a couple of people we have to pull out and uh, there has to be a, some abstentions. So uh, first I'd like to entertain a motion to hire the tenured teachers. I move that we hire the tenured teachers. I'll second that. So it's a motion from Buddy and a second from Scott to hire the uh, tenure teachers. Is there any uh, discussion from the audience? Any discussion or questions from the board? Man, the mask, keep it quiet, it's awesome. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. Okay, so we're gonna hire the non-tenure teachers and amongst those are two teachers that are family members of board members. So we will hire the non-tenure teachers minus Shay Keen and Sarah Keekover. One other note on that. Um, after the original list went out, we had a letter of resignation from Deb Emmett, who was a part-time school psychologist for us. So I did strike her name on there. So she, because she's resigned, she will not be getting offered a contract. Everybody understand that? All right, again, I'll take a motion to hire the non-tenured minus the uh, two mentioned teachers. I motion that we hire the non-tenureds as listed. I 
I'll, se I'll second. Okay. So it's a motion from Scott and a second from Sylvia. I know you said as listed, but that's minus the two, Shea Keen and Sarah Keekover. You both understand that? Okay. Uh, any discussion from the audience on that? Any discussion or questions from the board? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. All right, just because I went alphabetical order, uh, we'll pull Shea Keen out um, and vote on her first, which means Buddy has to abstain. Um, so if I can get a motion to hire Shea. I move that we hire Shea Keen. I second that. <laughs> All right. So it's a motion from Pam and a second from Scott to hire Shay Keen. Any discussion on that one? Board, any questions or discussion? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. And uh, finally, Sarah Keekover. I move that we hire Sarah Keekover for the 20. 122 school year. I'll second that. Uh, all right, so I have a motion from Pam, a second from Buddy to hire Sarah Keekover for the next year. Any questions on that? Any questions from the board? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. Now I gotta get past all my scribbles so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Other certified contracts. No. Here you go. Yeah, no, it's all part of the it's all part of the same mess. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now we're on to the extended leave absence. So within our contract with our teachers uh, uh, union, we have language in there that allows for a teacher to take an extended leave of absence. So it's basically um, a year of leave that they would take. There's some uh, follow-up in there as far as when they need to notify us that they're coming back and those type of things. And so under that clause, we have had one of our teachers approach us about taking a leave of absence, um, and uh, I won't go into any detail on why he's looking at a leave of absence, but it's my recommendation that we approve Seth Hirschkorn to take a, a year's leave of absence. I move that we approve the extended leave of absence. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, so I have a motion from Pam and a second from Joe to ex uh, approve Seth Hirschkorn's leave of absence for one year. Is there any discussion or questions on that? Any questions from the board? I think he'll be missed for a year. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. I believe it is Seth's intent to stick around and be, be part of the school, though, and still continue to coach speech and debate. Yeah, so he'll still be around and still be part of our, our students' lives. All right, uh, now it's contracts for physical and occupational therapy. So it's my recommendation that we go ahead and approve these two contracts for physical therapy and occupational therapy. Uh, these are basically the same contracts we had this year with these two people and they've done a good job. I move that we adopt the contracts as presented. I'll second it. I'm gonna let Cat have that just for okay. So motion by Joe, second by Cat. Yeah. So it's a motion by Joe, second by Cat to approve the physical and occupational therapy 
contracts as presented. Is there any questions from the audience on that? Are those for K through 12 or is that just from nine to 12? That's for K-12 special needs students. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Um, questions for the board? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. Okay. Updating the administrative matrix. So I talk to Lori on this as, as far as a lot of times we'll wait to do the administrative matrix after we've done the teachers contracts but uh, in anticipation of trying to get contracts done in a timely manner and those type of things um, my recommendation is a 1.5 percent increase to the base salaries on the administrative matrix and then the other part of that motion and we can do it separate if you'd like um, our curriculum director position, when we brought that position on last year, we brought that on on the assistant principal matrix, and it was a 207-day contract, similar to what the principals have. Um, that job has, has been a little bit bigger than what we expected, um, having somebody here full-time, and I would like to expand that to a 260-day contract, similar to what uh, Mr. Christman and I have, uh, so that uh, uh, Ms. Myers would be working year-round. And with that change in those added days, I would like to move that position from the assistant principal matrix to the principal matrix. Not matrix, excuse me. Matrix. amend that to include the 260-day contract to buddy yes please okay so I second uh, the recommendation of increase doing the one and a half percent increase to the base salaries on the administrative matrix and also a 260-day contract for a curriculum director did you say 250 or 260 okay okay so the motion is from Buddy and the second is from Sylvia to update the administrative matrix by one and a half percent and uh, to move the curriculum director to a 260 day contract. Um, are there any questions on that from the audience? Okay, any questions or discussion from the board? Nope, Kat does. The curriculum director is okay with going all year? <laughs> if you know Andrea, she's going to work all year regardless. It's kind of like the situation we had with Dawn, but uh, I'll let her answer that. She's online here. Yeah, I agree to what we've discussed here. Okay. Any other questions or discussion from the board? All in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. Okay. I need to, I'm sorry, my glasses keep fogging up. I'm having extra time. All right, we're going to move on to salary uh, recommendations for uh, our people not on these lists, I guess, is the way to put that. Yeah, so when we put this matrix together, we tried to kind of hit the main uh, position so that everybody's on a matrix, but we have a few uh, that are still out there that we just, they don't quite fit on a matrix based on the number of days they work or their duties that they have. Um, and that's Mr. Chrisman, uh, Mark Deering, if you remember last year, we moved him from hourly to salaried, uh, Lori, and then Darlene Hess as well too. And so based on that one and a half increase as you go through the steps and lanes and those type of things, um, the average increase on the administrative uh, matrix was about a 3.25% increase. And so I would recommend that same increase to those four people that are not on a matrix.
I'll second that. Okay, so it's a motion from Joe and a second from Scott to approve the uh, salary recommendation as presented. And I think we can safely say the 3.25 percent. So, are you okay with that, Joe? Saying 3.25? Yeah, it's just, I just it says a rough average, though, so I didn't want to put an extra. Extra. So the rough average was what the principals got, or the people that are on the matrix, the administrative matrix, um, with their steps and those type of things. And so this is. Um, the average of that is what I'm recommending for, for Don, Lori, Darlene, and Mark. Right. So, yeah, I feel better having, okay. well, I, I feel better having the 3.25 in our minutes. Okay. So I'd rather have you, if you say it with 3.25. Okay. okay, okay, Scott, you're good with that? Okay. So it's a motion from Joe and a second from Scott to provide a 3.25% salary increase to the people not on a matrix, I guess, is what I'm going to say for. So you got that over there, Lisa? Okay. Is there any questions uh, from the audience on that? Any question or discussion from the board? Tobin, um, I know that you do this for the principal or for the principals and the um, educators. Are, are you also kind of keeping track and making sure we're staying competitive with these positions as well and like the market and stuff too? Yeah, you know, they, they did not do a class A survey this year. And I don't know if the person that did that has kind of put that on the side or they've retired. So that's something I'm going to sit down and try and get the other superintendents to get going on that so that we have that data. But I don't have that current data right now. I've reached out to, um, I think I shared with some of the board members, I've reached out to like Hardin and Laurel and some of the, the closer class A schools. But, but uh, as far as statewide, I'm not 100% sure um, where we are competitive wise, but I'm going to try to work on getting that, that uh, survey up and going again. Yeah, and I think it's, I think we are safe. I don't, I'm not necessarily worried that we're not competitive. I just want to make sure, um, especially because this is a good crew, that we just make sure we're keeping them and making it worth their while. Thank you. All right, any other questions or discussion? Okay, go ahead. I know Tobin just said that the principals um, with their step ups, um, are they, because I know with the teachers that I work with, when they do their step ups, they got to pay out of pocket for their step ups. Is that the same here in Lockwood for like the principals and the teachers and all that? They got to pay that what matrix? out of pocket? I've never heard of paying out of pocket for steps. For their the, steps? No. Okay. You get a step based on your longevity. Right. So when, for them to take their, um, their trainings and to move up in their steps, they have to do um, extra training. So what you're right? talking about is lanes? Oh, yes, lanes. Sorry. So we is don't have different? lanes. We have, we have a lane for uh, assistant principals in certain positions, and then we have lanes for, for principals in other positions. So like we just moved the activity director, or the, excuse me, the curriculum director from the assistant principal lane to the principal's lane okay. based on the number of days that she's going to work. But no, they don't, they don't move over based on their training as they go forward. Got, it's based so, on what their role is. Gotcha. So I guess I'm not familiar with it as well, um, but when they do move lanes or if they're able to, that's extra training maybe you gave principals. Not training. for principals, it's not. So they, they okay. would not move lanes unless they move their jobs. So if. If okay. you move from a assistant principal position to a principal position, then you would move lanes, but it's based on what job you're doing. It's not based on your training. And would that be the same for teachers? No. No. No, teachers have, teachers have, so we, for our administrative matrix, we have two lanes. Okay. So either you're an assistant principal or you're on the assistant principal matrix or you're a principal on the principal matrix. Okay. For teachers, there's eight lanes. So it's based on the amount of credits they earn as they move over and then a master's degree and then moving over from there. Okay, so the 3.25 the 3 that you're coming, the, the average that you're coming up with, is that based on their trainings that they do? No, no. it's based no. on longevity. Okay. Just longevity. Longevity and the one and a half percent increase we just put to the base. Okay, I'm just making sure that the principles that these 
the four, I'm just wondering if these four that are, that are, that you are um, recommending that they have the same amount of training that the principals and all them have to do. They don't. It's, it's all based on, it, it varies by position. Mr. Chrisman would have more training uh, for his position w with Title IX and special ed. It's, it's based on what their job description is and what their expectations are. Okay. And right. the steps for principals, the steps on the principals have half the value as the steps have for the teachers. All right, let's get back to uh, where we were at. So we are, um, Tim. We have a motion. Uh, sorry, I, I think just to clarify that um, the positions though that are listed, I mean just knowing what the um, folks in those positions have to do, the level of continuing education that takes place is probably equivalent or more than um, what requirements are for educators at this point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean it's apples and oranges. I mean for a position like Mr. Chrisman's, obviously he has to have a master's degree in his administrative endorsement. Our facilities director doesn't have that type of formal education through a college, but he goes to training all the time on our different facilities and, and networking and those type of things. Uh, same with Ms. Mrs. Uh, Cam Cramvy, I'm gonna butcher that last name, uh, with Lori is, in a matter of fact, that's why she's not here tonight, is she's, she's off at the, the MASBO training, or their, their uh, district, uh, or, yeah, district conferences tomorrow. And so, you know, she's got more of an MBA type of an education or a, or a CPA type of an education rather than an administrative degree. Yeah, everybody's more than qualified for, for where they're at. All right. So, moving on, we have a motion from Joe and a second from Scott. Is there any other questions from the board or discussion from the board? All right. So, all in favor, say aye. Aye. And those opposed? And that motion carries. All right. Now we're moving on to hourly employees. And hourly employees is one of those places where you've been trying to get competitive, but it's not, we're not getting there really quick. Yeah, so this is the area that we really need to work on trying to get as competitive as we can. Um, and so this is our hourly employees that are not under the paraprofessional agreement. Um, if we can recall, we did a MOU with the, the paraprofessionals last month. So this is pretty much maintenance, custodial, secretaries for the most part. And so uh, what we would like to do is recommend, and, and what we've traditionally done is done like a flat rate increase, 25 cents, 20 cents, whatever it might be. And just talking with Lori, we, we really wanted to do a percentage increase this time. Um, just to try and get those, um, to try and be a little bit more competitive. So at this point, I would recommend a 4% raise for all hourly employees that are not covered by a bargaining agreement. I'll second that. Motion by Joe, second by Buddy. So it's a motion from Joe and a second by Buddy to approve a 4% uh, increase to all hourly employees. I like the not on a bargaining agreement. Is there any questions from the audience on that? Any questions or comments from the board? It's always the wage stuff that gets me. Um, it's, Tobin, do you remember off the top of your head what our maintenance um, position, what we've had it posted as like a entry level? I want to say it was like 11 or 12 or something. I, I want to say it's in the $12 okay. area. Good. Yeah, I, I definitely think this will hopefully. So help this would be like a 50 cent raise for, okay. for somebody there. Okay. We want to be able to hire somebody above what McDonald's is hiring them. We can't get there. <laughs> All right, and there's no other questions from the board? Comments? All in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. All right. Um, blackout days and Friday schedule. So uh, we approved the school calendar, kind of the, the bones of the school calendar at last month's meeting. 
And uh, if you recall in our negotiations with or our contract with the teachers, we have uh, what are considered uh, required attendance days. Uh, these were days we put in when we were bringing in professional development, those type of things, and, and putting out uh, uh, resources to get people here. We wanted to have all of our teachers here and not have them miss those days. And so on the calendar, if you take a look there, we've actually circled those days in red. So it's the actual, the very first day um, before school starts, uh, August 23rd. And then um, the two days in December, similar to what we did this year, if you recall, we, we extended that Christmas vacation for the students. We thought this was a little bit easier on parents and we're able to bring in training on the 20th and 21st. Also in our contract, we have what are called blackout days where we can limit the number of people that are gone. And so we've added those days there and they are the ones that are in blue on that contract. I won't go through them uh, day by day. And then one of the things that we felt worked really well this year in the secondary schools were the help Fridays where students that have fallen behind can come in on Fridays and get extra help, extra tutoring from teachers. Um, the other way to look at these are kind of like the incentive days that, that some of the schools used to have in the area. And so if you look at the green Fridays, we've identified those as Fridays that uh, only students that are falling behind would be required to come into school. And then we could also do additional uh, enrichment type things. Um, so like last Friday, we had the Hope Squad in here getting some training um, with uh, Frederick Lee that I mentioned last week or earlier in my report. Uh, so we've identified those as possible Fridays to do that. We've worked around a little bit. Um, if you take a look, like in January, there's two Fridays in a row that is leading up that is leading up to the semester. So kids that are at risk for not passing their classes can get a little last push there. And then you'll see the same thing in May. So any questions on any of that? Yes, the highlighted green Fridays. That was gonna be my question too. Oh, sorry. December 22nd. December 22nd, there's no school on that day. Okay. Everybody had the same scribble. <laughs> All right. So I'll entertain a motion to cover this. I'll move to adopt the calendar as presented. I'll second. So it's a motion from Kat and a second from Sylvia to uh, adopt the calendar as presented. Does that language work for that? What you were getting for? Okay. All right. Are there any questions from the audience on this? All right. Any questions or comments from the board? Based on our experience, positive experience with this year, why are we having school on any Fridays? Yeah, so it's really, it's really to, uh, so we hit all of our accreditation standards. We have to have a certain number of hours at each grade level unless we want to completely go to a standards-based or a uh, proficiency-based model on that. Um, I don't know that we're quite ready to go to that at this point. Uh, there would be a lot of policy changes and different things, and actually probably some negotiations that would have to go into something like that. Could we keep that on future agendas so that we don't lose sight of that and try to work towards that? Yeah. I think that would be a discussion that we'd want to have at our, our June or July goal setting meeting. And if that's something that the board wants to set as a, as a priority, I mean, that would be my marching orders to find a way to make that work. Thank you. All right, any other questions or discussion from the board? All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Did we lose Buddy? Or you just didn't hit it? He's got aye. It. Okay, all in, uh, all opposed, and that motion carries. 
approved summer conditioning program. Yeah. So moving forward with uh, high school athletic programs and those type of things, one of the key areas for success in that is the summer conditioning and weightlifting programs. And uh, most, most districts always have a dedicated person for that. We're, we're fairly blessed. We actually have a science teacher that has a background in training and has done an amazing job working with our teams and working with kids after school. And I'd like to approve Jake Bushnell uh, for up to four hours a day, four days a week over the summer to do a weight training and conditioning program. Uh, just as a note, this summer, what to keep things kind of consistent, we will go ahead and pay him the same amount that we're going to pay our summer school teachers, and that may be the way we do that going forward. Um, it may come out of the general fund. I'm actually kind of hopeful because it's a summer school program that we can we we can uh, market that way and that we could utilize some of the COVID funding. Yeah. I make a motion that we approve uh, Jake Bushnell for our summer conditioning program. I'll second. All right. It's a motion from Scott and a second from Sylvia to. Uh, Approve Jake Bushnell's our summer conditioning program. I didn't say that well. Um, is there any questions from the audience? I got a question. What grades are they for? Oops. What grades are they for? Is that middle school and high school or just high school? It'll probably depend on what kind of demand there is. Um, there'll be he'll have up to four hours available during the day, so he very well may say. Two of those are for high school kids, and two of those are for, for middle school. If depending on the number of kids that sign up, it would be prioritized high school first and the middle school second. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Are there any questions or comments from the board? Sorry, uh, that, uh, I did have the same question as Jamie. And then, um, do you think that that's something, if there was a high interest in the middle school, that we would consider maybe doing an assistant or anything? Or is this, since it's the first year, you'd want us to just stick with the initial program? I don't think we'd be any happier if we had an overwhelming okay. response, and then we could bring it back to the board and say, let's go ahead and add some more to that or add a second person to that. Okay. Um, but uh, let's see how many we have sign up first and then but if if there is a, a high demand we would certainly be able to to add some more resources to that will there be a cost for these conditioning programs to our students at this point we're not planning on having any charge for students to be involved in the programs any other questions or comments then all right, all in favor say aye. 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 Buddies, aye. Um, those opposed? And that motion carries. All right, spectator guidelines and seeing by the line on the fence, it's time. I was hoping Mr. Erickson would be here for this one. So, uh, so as I discussed in my uh, report, we are seeing everything kind of going into the green. Uh, Countywide, uh, obviously there's a lot more vaccinations that have taken place in Yellowstone County as well. And so I asked Mr. Erickson to kind of go through and take a look at where we're at with our spectator policy and with kind of open gym policy. And uh, so this is the policy that he put together by working with the CDC guidelines and updates. And what they're really stressing is to get away from flat numbers. Um, so if, like if you look at our current policy, it flat out says we won't have allow more than 50 people at any activities in like inside our auditorium. So in this room that's built for 700, we wouldn't have more than, than 50 people allowed. And so this is more of a common sense thing where as long as people from different households can remain six feet apart, uh, they can attend. Um, and then um, as you go through some of the guiding principles, um, we're only going to require masks when people are in kind of those common areas. So if you're sitting 
in the auditorium with people that you're around on a regular basis, your household, you don't need to have your mask on at that point. Um, but if you get up and go to the concession stand or you get up and go to the restroom or while you're being, the ticketing's going on, we ask that you wear a mask. Um, common sense things on there, um, stay home when you're sick, those type of things, avoid crowded areas. And then again, with outside events, um, so most of our spring stuff is track meet, softball, where you're outside. And all the research that I've seen, because of the air movement when you're outside, the six foot distancing isn't as big of an issue. Uh, masking's not as big of an issue. And so what we're allowing, you know, if, if people want to be outside and in the stands not wearing a mask, we're okay with that. Um, and even being like on the, the sidelines and those type of things without a mask. Um, as long as you're maintaining that six feet of distancing for the most part. So really what we're asking is when you come to an event, whether it's a concert in here this spring, um, if we host the Montana-Wyoming basketball game, if you're at a track meet, um, you use common sense and you wear a mask when you're around other people that aren't from your household. And then there's the open gym guidelines on there as well too, which are a little bit more... Uh, you know, if you remember last year, we were talking about, you know, wiping down volleyballs in between drills and basketballs and those type of things. And if you look at the updated CDC guidelines, we're really not worried about that, that touch spread. And so it's the open gym guidelines have been very simplified as well, too. So I entertain a motion for that. I motion that, please hold. I motion that we update the spectator guidelines as presented. I'll second it. I'll second. So I have a motion from Sylvia and a second from Joe to update the spectator guidelines as presented. It, and just a clarification and open gym guidelines as well too. Joe. All right. So including open gym guidelines. Is there any questions or comments from the audience? Jeremy Brandle. Uh, I just wanted to applaud the board for taking a approach of trying to get back to normal from the beginning. Uh, goes back to school, spectator policies. You guys have been really proactive to try to get back to normal. So thank you for that. All right, any other comments from the audience? All right, any questions or comments from the board? <laughs> I have no idea there. Um, mostly I think what this is is a personal responsibility is, is what we're going back to. So when you're in those common areas, it's not that painful to wear a mask for five minutes until you sit down. I mean, that's, that's the way I look at it. Um, so any other comments or questions? Seeing uh, none? One quick question. Are we going to be able to do concessions then, Tobin? Or have we started and I have just been out of it? Yeah, we've started concessions. They're actually doing them. They were doing them tonight at the, at the track meet. It'd just be nice to have people there so they can actually make money. So, <laughs> All right. Any other questions then from the board? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. And moving on to uh, our emergency COVID policy updates. Yeah, so these are real similar. Um, if you recall, when we first put these policies in, um, that was back in uh, March or April of last year when, you know, we were still uh, early in this and not really knowing what was going on. So I'll just kind of walk you through. Um, in 1903, we struck the line about physical meetings, gatherings, and events should be limited to 50 people when held inside the school building. And then on the second page, top of the second page, um, just clarified that there's a difference between a visitor trying to come to the school during a regular school day or a visitor coming to attend a public event. So. Um, coming to the school, they have to be approved by the principal, those type of things. If they're coming for a concert, we don't want to specify, you know, approving every single person that comes to a concert um, or a, 
you know, if, if there was an assembly or something like that, that, you know, a ward assembly or something. So um, that policy we just passed, that will apply to people that are coming to public events at the school. And then facilities use, we're trying to open the facilities up a little bit more for community groups, uh, AAU basketball, travel volleyball, uh, those type of things, uh, camps. Um, uh, you know, we've got the youth sports program going on, and so we've kind of clarified that that has to co coincide with uh, the open gym guidelines that we just put together, kind of that common sense type thing, um, but being able to allow groups to use. Right now, we're kind of allowing like outside groups to use the outside facilities, so like the lacrosse kids are out practicing on our facilities, but we weren't allowing a lot of that indoors. We did open it up to Lockwood only groups, so like the Lockwood AAU wrestling and some of our volleyball clubs and, and those type of things were able to use it, but this would open it up for um, groups outside of Lockwood that, that want to utilize our facilities uh, uh, to rent. Uh, Lockwood Little League is another one that's been using them as well, too. So those are the changes to 1903. And then on 1905, there's a, quite a few more changes. Um, you know, and we actually had a discussion about going to, you know, having masks be optional completely. Uh, we felt like that was just uh, too much of a change right now for students and staff, and it would be confusing and having it be different in different buildings. Um, so what we actually did was we changed the physical distancing. This now talks about the CDC guidelines of three feet for children and adolescents, whereas six feet for adults. Uh, we scratched a few things like, you know, early on this process, we were gonna have, you know, teachers going out and greeting elementary kids on the playground and bring them in and temperature checks and those type of things, and, and we've put away that. Um, one thing we did clarify in the language is that face coverings are required on school buses at all times by all riders, and that's a federal order. That was new when the Biden administration came on board. So anything that falls under federal transportation, that is a requirement. So, you know, if you fly, it's not Delta requiring the mask. It's actually the federal government requiring that. Um, we struck some language about how meals would be delivered, those type of things. Uh, clarified um, that adult visitors need to maintain the six-foot distance. Obviously, with uh, if we have student visitors, that three feet would apply to them. And um, there on the top of page three, we struck six feet and replaced it by three feet again. And then I added one more bullet point, kind of clarifying persons sitting in the stadium, auditorium, or bleachers who are physically distanced from other spectators who are not from within your household. Uh, can go ahead and remove their masks. Uh, scratch some cleaning things based on the updated cleaning uh, recommendations. And I believe that was everything. Oh, I guess on page five, clarified again that buses that do the federal regulations or federal, federal mandates, face coverings are required on school buses. And that is the extent of those changes that I'm recommending. And I'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the updated COVID-related policies for um, Lock Lockwood School. All right, so it's a motion from Pam and a second from Joe to update the uh, emergency COVID policies 1903 and 1905. Is there any questions or comments from the audience? All right, any uh, questions or comments from the board? And Joe, pass Joe. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Hold on, Joe. On uh, page two, uh, you, you just skipped over and I just wasn't understanding it. The uh, dealing with parent arrival times to drop off and pick up students. It says drop off, pick up students will be completed in a manner that limits direct contact between parents, staff members who adhere to social distancing recommendations in the exterior of the building. Um, I understand why we struck that. I, I'm curious, and this is just personal curiosity, 
What times are the kids able to be dropped off currently? It's because I drop mine off whenever. The, uh, middle school, I did have somebody ask about elementary school too, and I didn't have an answer. So it, it says here, parent arrival times to drop off, pick up students, riding with parents, and caregivers may be staggered in designated areas by grade level through a schedule set by building administrator. And I, this is just curiosity, I just don't know. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, middle school is 8.30, it's in our handbook, so half hour before. Is there really Half hour before school starts? Yeah, unless okay. there's special arrangements made. If they meet with the teacher, we have an early bird math class going, uh, special groups or sporting events, but for typically it's 8.30. Okay, thank you. All right, you understand that then, Joe? Yep. Okay. I want to reemphasize, this is a thought pattern we have to change as the future goes on. We are one district, but we are four schools. We are not one school anymore. And uh, I know that's going to take a long time for people to figure out, but it's, it's something we have to start to accept. Um, any other questions or discussion from the board on this? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. Um, all right, uh, out of district student policy, 3141P. Yeah, so when we went through and updated our elementary policies to add the high school, uh, we, our out of district policy for high school is a little bit different. We just stated that we would not get, put ourselves in a situation where it became an issue with our, sta our accreditation standards. Um, what we had previously was basically one student per teacher, and so in the middle school we had limited our out-of-district students to seven per grade level. And if you take a look at our enrollment, you know, seventh grade has about 35 fewer kids than eighth grade this year, but we are at the maximum for out-of-district students, so if we have any other seventh graders, we have to turn them away even though we really have room in those classes because that's a smaller class. So I'm just asking that we strike that, that one line in, in the policy uh, uh, 3141 promulgated to scratch the seven student limit in the middle school. And that would allow us, obviously we're not gonna take kids to where it gets to be an accreditation issue, but that would allow us to take more kids to keep our class, our grade levels a little bit more uh, standard from year to year rather than having 145 kids and then 115 kids, we could fill those smaller grade levels with a few more kids. All right, I'll entertain a motion. I make, I move that we uh, adopt the change there, striking line 43 out of the out of district kids policy. I'll second that motion. So it's a motion from Scott and a second from Kat to, um, I'm just gonna say update policy 3141P. Is there any questions or comments from the audience? I guess, my my thought is, you know, instead of opening it up to the high, to to out of district, why not keep it that way, so that it'll be better for our students, our kids that go there to keep a smaller classroom, and for our teachers to have a smaller classroom if that's the case. I, I just I don't know if that's, um, I mean I know they pay money for us to for them to come in, but it would be beneficial for my child and I'm sure the rest of the community's kids to have smaller classrooms if that's the case. Just keep the classroom small and keep a, a, mac, a number on there. That's my thought. So that's a common uh, question, I guess, with out-of-district students. And w what you're really looking at with out-of-district students is very rarely is it more than one or two kids per class. We're not bringing in 40 kids in one grade level that's going to increase the class size by three or four kids. You're talking about one to two kids 
per teacher. And uh, right now, uh, out of district uh, tuition and, and uh, funding from the state, we're bringing in about $400,000. So that allows us to hire several teachers to offset. Um, so really, I believe that out of district students allow us to have a bigger staff, which actually does lead to smaller class sizes for everybody's students. And also, we don't just automatically accept if they apply to be out of district students, we don't automatically accept those. They are vetted through the building principals. So if they're a, a child that we don't want, we won't accept them. So any other questions, comments from the audience? Any questions or comments from the board? I have a comment. I'm not totally opposed to thinking that we can't think about our kids in our community and also think beyond that that uh, the old stigma of the wrong side of the tracks. We talk about the river, but just because they live on the other side of the river, um, can't they participate in what all we have to offer here also, especially if we can benefit a child that's going to, you know, do better here than where he was. So I think that's always worth consideration too, taking in out of district students. Any other comments or questions? And Joe's got a question. This is more a comment than a question. Uh, and I, to some uh, extent, I agree with you. I don't know your name, but thank you for commenting. Um, that we don't, we have learned through this pandemic, we don't necessarily need the kids here full time to have smaller students or smaller classes and still have great test results and, and great educational opportunities for the kids. But that's for a future conversation. On this one, should we not consider how we reword that hole from line 40 to 46? Uh, if we have the resources in the district, to educate um, up to uh, what we've got currently is remain at least one student less than the state accreditation standards in grades six through 12, then doesn't that establish a limit already? Why do we have limits at any grade? So we're striking the middle school one, but we're leaving the K-5 one. It's just a, just a comment. Um, maybe next planning session next summer when we're doing policy changes, we consider that. Yeah, I guess, Joe, that's kind of where we, you know, to address that concern that we're going to have larger classes because of, of uh, allowing out of district students. That's what, that's what we did when we went through the policy process to keep it and make sure that we weren't bringing in too many kids to where it became an issue with accreditation. You know, so that's kind of, it, it is kind of the, a, a limit, but what I'm looking at more is, so, you know, so we talked about seventh grade. Um, you know, we had a student that was a, a student that had gone to school here previously, staff member's child, um, that uh, didn't go to school here first semester and, and had some issues and those type of things. He was the seventh student we let in in seventh grade. And like I said, even though we have the same staffing for seventh grade and eighth grade, and eighth grade has 30 plus more students at this point. So the idea is to, instead of having a roller coaster, is to kind of get to that, that steady level and have steady um, staffing and, and students across the board for grade levels. So, I mean, the board would have the, you know, the discretion to, if, if we had a grade level where we were at that level, so let's say, let's take an elementary class just because that's a little bit easier. If we were at, um, you know, 29 kids across the board in fifth grade, and we had a waiting list of 15 out of district kids, the funding we would get from those 15 out of district kids would obviously offset the cost of adding an additional teacher. So we could add another teacher at fifth grade level, and then the class size would actually probably go from 28 kids in six classes to probably closer to 24 kids in seven classes. So the board always has the discretion to do those type of things. So there's really not a hard level as far as a limit on kids we could bring in. There's a hard limit to the, we would have to add staffing as we add additional kids. And uh, 
at, we'd have to make sure that the, the reward was worth letting those kids in. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, same thing in your business, you know, at what point does the extra business that you can bring in uh, justify hiring an additional mechanic? Well, one of the issues, though, with out-of-district kids also is, is we go hiring a teacher this year for them. We don't know if we have them next year. So now are we overstaffed? So we also have to think about that. The, big, the reason we brought this policy in was we used to kind of arbitrarily bring in out-of-district kids. And there was no, I guess there was tracking, but there wasn't tracking, I guess. So it was really to kind of so we had an idea where they were going and what we were doing. Does that answer your question, kind of? It's something we can look at at, at yeah, uh, our board. It was more a comment. We're limiting it at, 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 for one of the schools and not limiting it for the other school and, and uh, not mentioning it at all for the high school. And just looking at that, it's like, why don't we have a consistent policy, although the numbers are going to be different because of the accreditation standards, why don't we have a consistent policy across the whole district? Well, what this, it, what this does is it basically makes middle school and high school the same by changing that. So you understand that? Yeah, yeah, the rewrite of two, I get, I get that. All right. Yep, and I missed that. I missed the ball part on that when I first read it. That's kind of what brought it to our attention with the high schools. We're like, hey, we're limited in middle school. We didn't do it in high school. So, all right. Any other questions or discussion from the board? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. Now the land lease. All right. So this has been an adventure. Uh, I've had a crash course in corporate real estate over the last few months. Um, so I actually posted an update to the language uh, earlier today after meeting again um, with Corning companies. And so uh, I'm just going to go, we're in a public meeting and I'm going to go ahead, you know, uh, St. Vincent's has asked us to kind of keep this uh, embargoed a little bit. Uh, they want to do a big press release and everything once things get up and going. But We've been working for quite some time on trying to work with uh, local health care providers to put a medical clinic here in Lockwood and here on our campus. And, uh, you know, Lockwood is a community the size of Mile City, and we have zero medical facilities on this side of the river um, uh, other than some chiropractors, and I believe there's a dentist now, and there might be one other. But... Uh, Anytime we want to go, anybody from Lockwood needs to go and get, um, see a, a general practitioner or a walking clinic or anything like that, you have to go to Billings. And so St. Vincent's has been partnering with us and we've been working on this. And um, one of the things that's made it more of a challenge is St. Vincent's isn't in the business anymore of really buying and building their own buildings. What they do is they work with uh, contractors um, land developers that will that will develop the building and then they lease it from them. And so through that process, uh, we went out for an RFQ and uh, Corning Companies was selected by St. Vincent's to partner on this. And so what we're trying to do is put together a land lease where we are renting them the piece of ground and uh, they pay us a monthly amount on that. And we're not looking to try and get rich off this or anything like that, just to justify the use of the land. Um, Corning will develop a building. They're talking about probably about a $3.5 million clinic that they will be building. And then St. Vincent's will sublease it from Corning companies. And what we're trying to do right now is come up with a draft land use agreement that clarifies um, what that property can be used for. And this is the complication from this is the fact, well, there's two different complications. 
Uh, Corning's going to need about a 20-year commitment to get back the capital that they're investing in the building of this building. And uh, obviously, medical buildings are, are quite expensive. On the flip side, SCL, St. Vincent, Sisters Charity of Leavenworth, um, are committing right now to 15 years on our campus for a clinic. And so Corning's worried that they may have five years that they have to go out and find another tenant. And so for them to get their financing and to make this effective for them, what they really want is as wide a berth as possible for what can be located in that building. Well, obviously as a school, we want to have tight say over what can be located in a building on our campus. And so the first big hurdle that we need to get over um, is, is this, what can that use be for? And uh, those of you that have been on the board for some time know one of the things that we talk about a lot uh, in our goal setting and those type of things, and even in the construction of this building, is we don't ever want to get in a situation where we saddle a future superintendent or we future, saddle a future board. Uh, I don't know about any of you guys, but I don't plan on being the superintendent here in 15 more years. Um, hopefully I'm on a beach somewhere at that point. Um, but... Uh, we don't want to saddle a future superintendent or future board with a situation where they look back and go, what in the world were they thinking? They've put us in a really bad spot. Uh, some of you that have been on the board for a long time have, have had that happen to you by previous boards. So we've been working our way through this language, uh, working with our attorney as well. And so we, we've kind of came up with this language, and this is hot off the presses this afternoon. Um, and so the language that we actually added references um, the limitations on a small P2 zoned area defined by the zoning code uh, that's the Joint Billings Yellowstone County uh, Planning Organizations, the, the, the Joint County Planning Board, City County Planning Board, excuse me. And so if you go to there, I put a uh, uh, list of that code there. It's a, it's a spreadsheet, and you can go down that. And so we're over on the far right, and it's fairly restrictive what can be in those type of areas. So you can't have any kind of restaurant. You can't have any kind of bar or casino. Um, and you can go down that. And so what I did is I took the things that were in that P2 area, and that's one of the other challenges. Um, you know, let's just be honest. Um, if we'd have been doing this 20 years ago, there... Uh, you know, medical marijuana or some of the other different things that have, have uh, developed in our state would have never, ever been a concern. And so who knows what's going to be a concern in 20 years. Um, so there's a list of things that have been approved for, and we've been very clear with, with Corning, and, and they understand, especially with the investment they're going to have in a medical-grade building, they're going to lose money if they go in and take out all the medical equipment and those type of things down the road because they can't find another tenant, and then they put a coffee shop out there. Um, so they're going to do everything they can to keep it as a medical facility, but this is kind of a worst-case scenario type situation. And so the other language that we added that are things that are permitted in a P2 zoned area that we would not allow in ours, I went ahead and added their list, listed them as exceptions. So any residential use, we don't want that to turn into condos on our campus. Um, uh, any place used for religious assembly, that just kind of the separation of school and church there, not showing a favoritism towards a certain religion. Uh, government facilities used for yards and storage. Um, I'm fine if they want to put a post office out there, but we don't want it to be a county shop area where they store spare pipe and those type of things. Um, a hospice center, a shelter, uh, crematory or funeral services, and my thought on that is if you have funeral services there, the traffic could get quite bad at certain times. Uh, cemetery, uh, that kind of goes for its own... Uh, Short-term rental, which goes along with the residential side, any waste or salvage uses, and then wireless cellular towers, just because that's been controversial in some other school areas. So we added all those. I put a reference to the table on there, um, struck some language on there that they had concerns with. 
you know, really the language I had in there was, you know, any, any use shall be deemed appropriate to be located on a K-12 school campus. The problem with that is that almost has to be, that almost has to be uh, a legal issue if it ever gets to that of what can and cannot. Um, and then we talked about the, the deadline. So if they ask to have something to be used for a different use, unforeseen use that we don't have listed specifically in here, they would, they would petition the board, the future board, and ask to say, can we make this a virtual reality amusement park? And the board would have 60 days to respond to that. If it's something the board wanted to deny, they could deny it within those 60 days. Um, if they don't take action within those 60 days, that other use would be considered approved at that point. So uh, just something that future superintendents, future boards need to be aware of. Um, again, as like when you're working with attorneys or, or uh, this is all worst case scenario situations. I mean, hopefully, St. Vincent's goes in there, they have great success with their community clinic, and we have a clinic on our campus for the next 40 or 50 years that, you know, and there's a lot of benefits to this, you know, just uh, internships for our kids that want to go into the medical field, being able to go right there on site. Uh, you know, I just think about, you know, the different sports and things that we host. A kid breaks their arm, they can go over and, and get it checked. Um, I've, when I was coaching, I spent lots of time sitting on a bus outside an uh, emergency room because um, a kid had been taken there. Um, uh, staff can go over, instead of missing work to go down and go to a walk-in clinic, they would be able to go over on their prep period or their lunch uh, and, and, get, uh, and get an appointment. So it would be a combination uh, primary provider clinic and a walk-in clinic serving the community of Lockwood. So, Did you mention the sports physicals too? That they would work with us on those yeah all those all those obvious little partnerships that you can do when you have a place on campus um, obviously this has been something that we as a board have been working towards and you guys have set as a goal for for probably the last five five ten years maybe I'm thinking, I'm thinking ten years at least I know there was the clinic with Riverstone um, prior to me even coming ten years ago so there's there's been quite a few uh, Don and I can tell you we've started and stopped on this many a times with many different providers. Um, this is as close as we've ever gotten. Um, so what I would ask is that the board approve this allowable use. This kind of gets us over the next hurdle. We still have a full contract. I think it's like 30 pages to go through. Um, obviously, we, I'm not an expert in corporate uh, real estate and mortgages and subletting and all those type of things. So we will be working with our attorneys on that. But I think if we get this in place, Corning will feel comfortable moving forward with getting their permitting and those type of things going. They were actually kind of hoping to have broken ground by this point. This, is, this process has taken a long while to get to where we're at here. Um, but, uh, you know, that's one of your guys' board goals is to be uh, uh, value added to our community. So somebody that doesn't have kids in Lockwood schools sees value in Lockwood schools. And I think if you talk to anybody in Lockwood that they would say that that's one of the big holes missing in our community is, is medical care here in our community. So we're actually just approving language. We're not approving a contract, so. Yeah, and once we get to that contract, I will work that out with the attorneys. And either if the board's okay with me moving forward with that, we can do that, or we can have a special board meeting to approve that contract. It's, it's, it's your choice on that. This is just the sticky wicket. So if I understand you right, Tobin, you're saying that what we are approving tonight is agreeable to Corning. Yes, I was on a conference call today with Steve and Lily Corning, and then Lily and I finalized this language this afternoon. Okay, great. In that case, I move that we approve the land lease with Corning Companies to be put into the contract that we'll ultimately sign with them. So it's a motion from Pam and a second from Sylvia to approve the I want to just clarify, this is just the language, okay, the language for land. the land usage, all right, you guys both on board with, okay. 
So, Lisa, that's how you have it in there? Okay, that's what I want to make sure of. Is there any questions or discussion from there is? Yes. Uh, my name is Katie on Ryan. This is the first I've heard of any of this. I have lots of questions. Um, one question is, is when did we become a school district that leases our land really for private corporation use? even though it's gonna benefit the community, why not just sell that chunk of property and put that money, bank it away for something, future growth of our school? I don't understand the leasing of the land. Well, this is something that, again, it's been over 10 years we've talked about doing this. For a long time we had, not a long time, for a period of time we had, um, Riverstone Health was in one of our buildings and that's kind of how this all started. Um, so it was always been a kind of a goal to get some kind of clinic on our campus because we couldn't seem to get anything else in Lockwood. Um, we went through, we've tried every medical provider in the town and SCL, when they got on this, were so excited about doing this. And they're a nonprofit. And they are a nonprofit. So it, uh, um, it just seemed to be the way to go. Once these guys were like, hey, we want to do this. This is the way we want to do it. It's the way they do it. Um, well, St. Vincent's is nonprofit, but not the the other one that we're changing the verbiage for, is that correct? I mean, someone's gonna make money off of it, right? Yeah, they're gonna make money. Yeah. So whatever they make, for it. So I'm not against having a, uh, you know, obviously having a medical facility here. I'm just wondering why that's not being done on the private side. I know we wanted to have that, you as the board, and I know in the past we've had, what, the caravans that come in and they treat our students and then they leave the property. Um, is there a reason why the public could not continue to use mobile facilities like that? Or why are we leasing our land? Well, they, they uh, St. Vincent's brought that, that mobile van in that was here a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. But they want to get into a bigger facility, something that they, they, it has to be viable for them. So that van, really not viable for them. It's, it's really just kind of sitting there and we weren't getting, I don't know what we have, how often there was actually a, a doctor or whatever in there. So this would provide something that would be viable for them, would help the community. That's our biggest thing. Um, and it's going to give us a little kickback in money, but it's mostly just to provide. We get a major kickback, though, if we just sold that plot. Is that correct? What's that? If we sold the plot of land flat out to this builder, we would probably be better off? No. No. no? Why not? You're always better off having land. Yeah. yeah, and we're not a big company, though, are we? We're, we're a community that's making, generating we're taxpayers. income. Yeah. So St. Saint, Saint Vincent's is committed to our community. They want to be in our community, and they want to expand their footprint in our community uh, beyond what we were able to do with the, the mobile clinic. Uh, we're talking radiology, all those type of things. So x-ray, um, we actually, for quite a while, talked pharmacy as well, too. Um, and, and they ended up, uh, their models didn't support the pharmacy. Um, they were the ones that brought in and, re and required, this would have been a thousand times easier if St. Vincent's was willing to come in and build the building themselves, and we wouldn't have had to inv inv involve Corning. Um, but they were the ones on their end that wanted to bring Corning in because of that initial investment of the three and a half million dollars. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it really is, and, and this is a nationwide movement towards having partnership clinics on school campuses. Um, it's, it's what's found to be the, the best model. And so, uh, you know, we're just trying to find a way to get those services out here in our community and as a district be able to serve the community for people, again, that don't ha necessarily have students in our school district. No, I just, I just wonder why we're doing it at all. Yeah. I think that's my, I, I get the, the generosity of it, the idea of the community having health Care and all that. I would also think that if if St. Vincent wants to do that, there's you know why not buy a private piece of land and do that? Uh, what what's our so so the other part of that, Katie, is 
we hold on to that land, we own that land, they will pay us rent on that for the next 20 years, but once that, their, once their contract expires with their renewals, we actually will own that building and the land still. So down the road, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, that could be a office building for different things. That could be a CTE type center for medical arts. There's a lot of things that could come out of that down the road. Um, like I said, I, mean, I don't think it's ever a bad thing to have a company come in and invest three and a half million dollars on your campus to, to bring uh, another business in. That's value added to the community. It is, a, it, you're right. It's just adding a business to a school campus. It, it just seems like a conflict. I get it. I get what you're saying though. Thank you. So Katie, you're satisfied with that answer and So I guess I got a couple comments and then a question. And um, Katie, probably to you, it's kind of the field I work in. Um, St. Vincent's really isn't in the, the business of buying and building land right now. And the mobile provider that you talked about isn't really a profitable entity for them. So they have to show in their market that it's viable solution. So bringing a mid-tier, mid mid-level uh, provider out once a month may not really pay the bills for them, if that makes sense. Um, and from our perspective, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it keeps strip clubs from coming in <laughs> on the parking lot. It keeps pot shops from popping up. We control. Well, yeah. So I'm in favor of having a medical provider out here for obvious reasons and for personal reasons. Our kids playing sports and everything out here, and much of the community, it's easier for them to get to a medical provider close here. And I think that's probably why a lot of people have said in the past they like to have the, the mobile coach here, but it just doesn't make sense on both sides of the equation. Um, so anyways, those are, I guess, my comments. But my question, and I think, Tobin, you kind of alluded to it, and I've been kind of picking at you for a while to try to get this information. And I think you knew that you had the answer, but you couldn't share it. Um, but it sounds like you kind of know what those uh, services you're looking to provide outside of just the primary care, radiology, things like that. Is that yeah, so that, that we've been working on this for quite some time. And, and the reason it hasn't been brought up openly in meetings is, is it's been kind of embargoed through St. Vincent's. They want to, when they come in, they want to come in and do a big press release and those type of things. But as we start having to take action on this, you know, we, we need to make it, we, we can't do things not in public. Um, yeah, so their goal is to have it be dual purpose clinic. So it, you'd have your, your primary providers there and you would also have a walk-in clinic. Um, and their intent is, and, and, and we've kind of been out of that planning part of it probably for the last five or six months, but when we first started having talks, there was things like, you know, they wanted to be able to do, uh, for the walk inside of things, you know, being able to do x-rays and those type of things and stuff. So um, I can't tell you for sure exactly what there's going to be in there, but it's going to be, it's not going to be the mobile clinic. It's going to be basically a full-service clinic, similar to what they would put in in a community like Laurel or Miles City. Um, Lewistown has one similar to that. So if you've ever been to those, and you probably have, uh, those facilities in, in, in Lewistown, Miles City, uh, Glendive, they, they, it's going to be similar to that. Um, and this isn't going to be a moneymaker for St. Vincent's either. I mean, they, they've told me that this is going to be a loss leader for them. They're just trying to look to expand their footprint, um, build brand loyalty, you know, Coke, Pepsi type brand loyalty and, and uh, um, be able to get people to the Lockwood community to utilize St. Vincent's. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're right, Tobin, that this is a footprint or a model that uh, healthcare providers or facilities are moving more towards in critical access and rural communities. Um, that's more of a, they call it uh, ready care, basically. So it'll provide your, your primary care, a lot of times with a mid-level provider, a PA or nurse practitioner, something like that. And then basic x-ray, maybe ultrasound. So kind of sounds like similar footprint. That's all I was trying to get to. Thanks. Am I allowed to talk? 
Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> hi, Dad. Um, so I think it is a great idea, but it can also be scary because not a lot of kids do want to go to the hospital. It's not like the kids' choices or anything. I know that. But it could also be scary for the idea of something being there like that. Like, nobody would want to come to school if they knew there was going to be stuff like that around. And, like, I'm afraid of anything that has to do with doctors or anything like that. But it would also be a help if they had something to know what's secure. And the question I had would be, would the school be paying some of the problem if they were like in charge of watching us if we got injured or would our parents be paying the full amount? Yeah, it would be the same as going to any kind of medical provider. So it, it would be a, a clinic, a full service clinic ran by St. Vincent. So if it, it, instead of, if you got hurt playing volleyball, instead of having to go to the emergency room, you could possibly go to the clinic here and see if your arm was broke or your ankle was broke or those type of things. Um, for further care, emergency care like that, if they found out it was broke, then they would probably take you to the, the regular hospital. So it's just like a checkout. Yeah, that's a good way to, to, to put it. It's, it's a limited clinic as far as what all services they can provide. So like I said, if you, if you hurt your ankle, they could check your ankle to see if it's broke or not. I would imagine you would probably have to go to the regular clinic to get your ankle set if it was broke. If it wasn't, then they could put a splint on it and those type of things here at this type of a clinic. Do they give shots? I'm sure they would. That's a big no-no for kids. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, it's just, uh, if I ever talked to my friends about this, they'd probably say that they would never want to go there, even if they were like saying, oh yeah, let's go to the hospital because I got my leg broken. It'd be like, no, I don't want to go there. It's scary to go to school where they have something that big or that, like that right there. And it's going to be scary to even imagine just going to school when you know you have someone over there. That's all I had to say. Wait, wait, Tati, don't leave. I have a different question to ask you then. So I thought of it the opposite way, that I thought that my kids would feel safer that if they got hurt at school, that they don't have to wait for me to come and pick them up and then drive 30 minutes to our care provider where I could pick them up and in five minutes we could be somewhere where they could start getting them help instead of having to ride in a car being injured. Yeah, I get that. I get that some kids do like that, but knowing the kids that I know, that's mainly the majority of the kids in middle school and some of the younger ones and some of the older ones, they don't really get hurt. <laughs> they don't really make a big deal out of it unless it's like a big thing, like you can see their bone. But sometimes they're like, you can maybe skin half of their knee and it won't even bug them because they're like, okay, there's pain there, but it's not that big of a deal. But there are those some kids that paper cut their finger and start crying about it. Yeah. Sadie, we're not, we, we'll still have our school nurses and, and people like so that. You don't have to walk all the way over. No, that, it would be only for something that you would normally go to the regular hospital or clinic for. So like you get a, could, I, could you get a checkup there? Yes. You and could do your sports physicals there. You could go get your flu shot there. You could do <laughs> anything. That changes my mind. Because anything like, you do with your regular doctor. We don't have to go all the way out to Billings. We can just stay in our Lockwood area. Get your three-minute limit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, Sadie. I have a, a couple questions. Tobin, you said that after so um, after so many years, 20 years, you said that we're going to own the building. Are we? I thought that we were just leasing. Can you clarify that? Like we're leasing the land. We're leasing the land. They're putting the building on there. At the, is it St. V's or is it Co that other? Corning's building Corning. the building. St. Vincent's is going to rent the building from them. Mm -hmm. So the land lease will be written into the St. Vincent's fees that they pay right. Corning. And then at the end of the contract, the school would have the option to either have them destroy the building, tear it down, raise it, you know, just like you do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so if there's a McDonald's in the parking lot in front of a Walmart, 
those buildings a lot of times don't hold any value, so Walmart wants them to just destroy the building. So we would have that option. And when I say we, I'm talking 12 superintendents removed from me, um, but they would be able to keep that building if they would like and be able to utilize it for whatever uses there would be as so a school Courtney district. So is going to donate that building back to the school? They're not donating. It's part of the contract. That it's our building at the end of the, at the, end of the contract. Okay. But they're just building it. Our property, but not. The they're property. they're not going to come in and put the build. They're not going to come in and put a three and a half million dollar building on the back of a flatbed truck and haul it somewhere else. They're either going to tear it down or no, they're going to leave it that. for us. I mean, I, I do real estate, so I understand that. I know about landlords. I know about all of those things. So, what I'm telling, what I'm asking, at the end is so. I think it's a great idea that we do have some type of clinic here in Lockwood. Don't get me wrong. But what I don't, where there's a conflict is, is that it being on school property, that being publicly funded, and it being a business. So um, anyway, I was just wondering if that would be our building at the end of the yeah, the, the building is not publicly funded. They're paying for that building. They're building it on their own dime. But after the 20 years, you're they give it to saying us. it it's will ours. be ours. Yep. And there will, throughout that entire time, be public benefit the entire time yes. that, it's, uh, that it's here. And, and the only way it would be used for anything other than a clinic is if St. Vincent's eventually pulls out or the contra their 15 year, after 15 years they decide it's not viable and those last five years... Corning has agreed to all these ideas. We've got things in there, um, things that we believe are community, you know, add to the community, but that's the worst case scenario. I mean, again, they're investing in the high end, the cabling and all those things that go be, be into medical above and beyond a typical strip mall type of a situation. So they're gonna want to do everything they can to have it remain a medical facility, but we also have to give them some leeway in the worst case scenario that they could find another renter if they had to. I get that, but worst case scenario, I mean, it is still a business, and I don't know if that's, and I don't know if, for the public, for that being that the school should have that type of um, contract. I don't even know what I'm saying. Uh, have that type of uh, business relationship um, with, our, with our tax dollars. That's all I'm saying. Like, it's worst case scenario, what happens is if, if it does happen and people do leave. I mean, I get renters that leave all the time um, for whatever reason and you are stuck with it. And is that something that the school and the district want to be dealing with 20, 15 years down the line? I mean, that's something that you guys need to think about. And the public is going to, I mean, the public needs to know these things too, because that's our tax dollars that bought that property. So at the end of it, your tax dollars that bought the property in the meantime is going to be making money instead of the land just sitting there. And then when it's all said and done, your tax dollars, instead of just sitting there, got a $3 million well, it's building. it's still sitting there. Regard I mean, we bought it. Why did we right. buy it in the first place? The land is right. there. Why did we buy the land in the first place? For what reason? Access. For what? Access. Access for what? What? To the campus. Okay. So it should be used for school campus, right? For the school for our children, for, for education, what you guys are supposed to be for. So right? we're for the community. So we're, we're assuming that right. you're pretty strongly against having a clinic here. No, in absolutely not. But I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a space for it, it. I don't believe it's a spot for school to be involved in with the public's tax dollars. If they want to build a clinic, I don't, I, I'm all for it. But I think that it needs to happen on private ground and with private um, money and not be and put all of you guys in charge of our tax dollars and our, our, our piece of land that all of us own. 
That's all I'm saying. So as a taxpayer for the investment we already have here, you'd rather have no return. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. In the case of the worst case scenario, that what Tobin just explained, that... Worst case scenario is we go back to empty lot. Right. Two, not, two things, we can, we can provide the space for a community need, and we can save the taxpayers money because it increases revenue to the school district. We are being fiscally, fiscally responsible with the assets that we have. Now, the same argument you're using could be used to say, well, we better not rent this facility out for the chamber orchestra to use because that's a private business, and this is for us. Same thing. And I do believe that there's people in the community that don't feel against that because they feel as though that, that we built the school, we voted for the school, right. and we still don't have access to the school other than the symphonies and, and other sports events. Why do you say you don't have access? That's, that's another discussion. Because I'm sorry. of COVID. In this particular case, in this particular case, there's nothing but an upside to the taxpayers. And that is part of our role and part of the community service that we were sworn to as board members and that the community also voted for as uh, in the bond issue. There are many scenarios, I believe somebody mentioned it already, where the medical facilities rent space in the building, that's in the building. Orchard School did that for a while in District 2. All right, that had some drawbacks. You have sick people walking through the halls of the school to get to the clinic, okay? We didn't want that in our district, but we still need a medical facility down here. Um, how do I wanna say it? The community still has a need for a medical facility. We have the space, we have the availability, and we think this is a, a absolutely dynamic and positive um, uh, opportunity for the district and the communities. In what type of business? Renting out space that we have? Is leasing, uh, real estate? I mean, it's We're not in the real estate business. We're renting out space we have on campus. We're not going to run a business. We have lawyers. Making money. That's a business. The primary purpose of this is the benefits that it will be to our students and our staff. Uh, the community side of it is added on as a value added, like we said, for folks in the community that don't have kids in the school so that they see value in the school. But I mean, I, I could have my middle school or my principals explain to you the situation that we deal with with kids being pulled out for medical appointments all the time. If those appointments are here on campus and you're avoiding an hour of driving back and forth, that's going to benefit kids academically. If staff members don't have to take half a day off to go to a doctor's appointment and they can do it on their lunch time or their, their prep period, that's a benefit to our students. We would not be doing this if it was not a benefit for our students and our staff and academic benefit and also the benefit for the greater community. I just have a couple questions. Um, I'm new to Lockwood, been here about two years. Where is the facility going to go on campus first? So. If you're coming in the entrance, that open field there by the uh, drain collecting pond, it's gonna go on that little lot right next to the maintenance building. Okay. Is that gonna affect the entrance to the school to be able to, the flow of traffic for students, buses, those kind of things? Because you're, you're gonna have an influx of students who are gonna be driving, safety is gonna be a big issue. Are they gonna address that part of it with the way they build their entrances in and out of that facility? Well, they're gonna use our entrance and they'll so have some- So they're gonna some... create more traffic into the school? I, I don't think there's gonna be 100 cars, but there's gonna be a couple cars there. Well, it's, this is a walk-in clinic. You're right, it's a couple cars all day long 
on our campus, different people coming in and out. I guess, I guess the biggest thing is, is a safety issue is, is you're gonna have a, a whole group of young drivers in addition to that. Now you wanna add more traffic and I know that getting in and out of there in the mornings and in the afternoons can be kind of hectic. I, I mean, honestly, if you were gonna do that, I would think it would be a best benefit for the clinic to have their own entrance and exit so they're not using the school to have their drivers come in and out. Um, I mean, I get having the facility and it makes sense to have you know medical staff available in an event that there's an emergency and those kind of things, but honestly, to add that added frustration for getting in and out, because I mean, really you've got one entrance, now you're adding more traffic to it. So I think that would be something to address as far as, you know, just a safety platform. Um, in addition to that, um, after the 15 years that they lease, SEL leases, um, is there going to be a plan in place just in case some other facility doesn't want to come in? For those five years, like we don't want to see like the school have to pay out for that building for the next five years. So is there gonna be a plan in place so that if that happens, then we're not gonna be out of pocket as a school? No, that's, that's the language we're talking about right now. And no matter what happens at the end of the 15 years, we're not on the hook for that money. They, the company building the building is on the hook for that. Yep. The expectation, that's in force, that's a great reminder to our, something we've talked about uh, with our students, is the expectation of our students when they come in, they are not in the mornings uh, the, and after school, they are not to use the main entrance. Now I know I, if I, there's a few, some kids I do have to talk to occasionally on that. Our students actually use the, the Stonehaven Drive, the, which is the highway, the road in between the stadium and the um, and Hillside Village. And that was one of the reasons behind that was because we don't, we don't want them driving uh, in there in the mix with everybody else. So the expectation of our students is that they do drive on Stonehaven. No, I'm not oblivious to the fact that I don't have to talk to kids occasionally and like, hey, you're using the wrong entrance. You're supposed to be coming the right way. Uh, I, I realize that. But for the most part, our students do use Stonehaven rather than the main entrance to the building when they come in and out. Correct. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. It will increase. Yep. Yep. I agree. Yep. But it's similar to um, a lot of districts that only have one entrance into into their parking lots and stuff, and one road and stuff. That, that is correct. Yep. 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 There, there's, I mean, and there's some things that some districts have that we don't have that we don't have to deal with as well. That's close. So it's, it is. But but I just want to address the fact that the idea is that we won't have all our students in that same area as well at that time. Hopefully, I know that I'm not oblivious that believe it or not, not all the kids follow my rules. But um, I, I do know that occasionally I have to talk to some kids. But for the most part, they are using Stonehaven. No, 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 no. They, they park in the main parking lot because there's, there's the road that does then come in between the high school and the, and the stadium. And that's the road they come in. And that's why we actually space. They all aren't. No, I know they all aren't. We, but, and, that's, and some of them don't like the speed bumps I, we had put in there and stuff either too. So, no. Okay. All right. Okay. Yep. I'm way less worried about the young drivers. I live on this road. The people that drive at 80 miles an hour down this road are not all young drivers. So <laughs> I wish the deputies would spend more time on this road. Uh, Tim, just a couple of things that, that that road actually is a shortcut. My husband told me about it, and it is a lot shorter to get out that way. So uh, an advantage to being a board, at a board meeting. A um, couple of things as a parent who whose kid had, goes to clinics all the way on the west end it does take about a total of three hours for me to leave work go pick up my kid in lockwood take him back out all the way to the west end go to the clinic come back and drop him back i mean it's a huge loss of educational time um, i also have had the advantage of being uh, working for an employer who had an on-site clinic and it was so nice to be able to take my lunch break get the care that I needed and get back to work without having to ask for time off or worry about figuring out how to negotiate my kid's appointment and mine. It was just nice. It was very, very, that's the one thing I miss about working there. And as a child, I grew up going to a preschool next to a cemetery. So I appreciate you not allowing that to happen because that still leaves an impression in my brain. So thank you. Can you come, I can't hear you. I gotta come up the mic. Can you come up? Can you come up to the mic, please? The people on the camera can't hear you either. Uh, 
I just wanted to get back to what we were doing at the beginning. What are we changing the verbiage to? It's, uh, it's posted in the packet, so it is. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Oh, no, no, no. You, we were changing like four words, I thought you said. I mean, what are you voting on? That's what I'm asking. We're voting on the document that is included in the packet, and it's uh, the draft use memo. As a precursor to the contract, so it's not the contract. Are there any other comments or questions on this from the audience? All right. Are there any more comments or questions from the board? Doesn't look like we have time. Okay. Over there? All right. So we are voting on the language for the land use. Um, and the motion is from Pam, the second is from Sylvia. Just want to recover that. So all in favor, say aye. 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 And those opposed? And that motion carries. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. Again, it's something we've been talking about for greater than 10 years. So um, we're going to move on to our MRE and MTSBA memberships. And these, uh, I would think, will be less controversial because these are <laughs> next to required. So. I just recommend that we approve our membership. I just recommend. And I recommend that we continue our memberships in the Montana Rural Education Association and the Montana School Boards Association for next year. I motion to approve the MREA and MTSBA memberships for next year. I'll second that motion. All right, it's a motion from Sylvia, a second from Kat to approve the MREA and the MTSBA memberships for uh, next year. Is there any questions or comments from the audience? Any questions or comments from the board? All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. And those uh, opposed? And that motion carries. I move we adjourn. So we have a motion from Joe and a second from Buddy to adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.